this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this session. I also acknowledge that the people of this land maintain knowledge through an oral tradition practiced for generations. Today's session will um, hopefully run for not more than an hour. So um, pick up your beverage of choice. Um, I've prepared a smorgasbord for you. Grab a handful of nibbles and kick back while you, we bring you a delightful hour of fiction, fable or tale. Please enter any questions you have in, uh, for our speakers in the chat box and we'll collate these to feed through to our presenters after they share their stories. Um, the Bass Region is delighted to partner once more with Bank, for, Bank First to bring you today's session. This enduring partnership over the past four years has enabled ATEM members access to a range of products, information and topics such as financial literacy for women. We ordinarily see Doretta and or Warden at our member breakfast, which I know a lot of you have attended over the years. So we're delighted at this chance to include them in a digital event instead of a face-to-face -face gathering as we have today. So please welcome Doretta Chand, Relationship Officer, to share news of their current campaign, which is timely given our current economic climate. Over to you, Doretta. Thank you, Fiona, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the new mode of conferencing. I must say, I do miss the nibbles but after the events, but although recently my scales have been telling me it's probably not a bad thing. But like many of you, the, uh, it is the personal contact that I miss the most. So before I begin, I'd just li like to let you know that the um, advice I'll be giving you is general and may not be right for you. COVID-19 has certainly changed our lives socially, mentally and financially. My role as a relationship officer at Bank First is to visit schools, tertiary institutions and the health sector in order to assist their staff to achieve their financial goals. This, of course, was all snatched at a blink of an eyelid. Business development were the first team to be taken off the road. Our team has been working from home since the beginning of March. Naturally, there were some teething issues such as technological equipment, adjusting to the new work environment and getting used to online meetings, to name a few. However, having a fantastic leadership team helped with the adjustment tremendously. We have MS team meetings actually called Monday morning water cooler chats, which is purely a social event where footy, daily COVID numbers and Netflix are discussed. Quizzes on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, Wandering Wednesdays, where we invite a guest speaker from within our organisation, as well as business partners to share their current tasks, wins, challenges and different practices. We also have our immediate team meeting on that day as well. Again, very much a casual theme, which lately has been all about air fryers and the exchange of recipes. And lastly, Friday fry sides, a serious discussion where we share our reflections for the week what worked and what didn't, challenges, how we, we could be better supported and how we as a team can add value to the organisation as a whole. We conclude for the week with Friday Arvo drinks, a fun field late afternoon session with someone hosting it with games such as trivia, family feud, cocktail making and cooking dem demonstrations. These events have not only kept our team sane, but we also have the whole department involved for drinks and the quiz, enabling us to stay connected in a relaxed environment. The majority of Bank First staff were relocated to work from home. A feat, in the words of our CEO, would have taken months, requiring a white paper to have been prepared, then presented to various committees, revised, etc., etc. A long, drawn-out process. This relocation, however, was executed with precision and implemented within a couple of weeks. Only a handful of staff are working from the office due to the nature of their role, branch and system support staff on a rotational basis. Some of the other coping mechanisms or initiatives implemented by the bank first were free counselling, health and wellbeing sessions, a COVID day off and happy feet competition where pictures from your walk within your 5K radius was posted on the internet. An experienced team to receive and resolve hardship calls, very similar to the bushfire crisis was set up. 
Thank You Food Boxes was delivered to Mercy Health staff and the business development team is now participating on an online fundraiser for the perinatal research. In terms of banking, in terms of the bank providing our members with access to their accounts and support, it has in many ways been business as usual, with our online and remote banking services continuing to provide members 24-7 access to their accounts. Our customer contact centre and the other customer support staff, as well as the business development team, are all available, albeit by phone and video. Our branches are also open, however, we've had to reduce their opening hours. Being a business at the end of the day and taking into account the current economic crisis, some great campaigns have been packaged, which embraces the historical low interest rates. New home loan and refinance campaigns with rates as low as 1.99 and cash rebates for refinances as well as new insurances, including car insurances, are now available. So if you've not had your home loan reviewed or insurances reviewed for a while, it's the perfect time to do so. And for the, those of you that do, not, that do not have an account with us, we have the perfect package for you as well. So as you can see from our inception in 1972, we have been extremely customer focused. Today, we are a bank of over 100,000 customers and in excess of $2.3 billion in assets. We are a customer owned ethical bank with sustainable business practices. We do not invest in fossil fuels, and that is something I'm very proud of. We're invested in the Victorian education and health sectors, both giving and caring sectors of the economy. We provide grants and sponsorships to events such as this to enable our customers to look after the needs of others while we look after yours. So no matter what happens in your life, you can bank on us to be there. Thank you and take care. Thanks so much, Doretta. It's lovely to hear the news from the bank and to know what great work you've been doing out in the community through this really challenging time. It's lovely to see you and uh, we have some material on um, the current products that we'll, uh, from the bank that we'll um, send out at the end of the session. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I'll now um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Nick Ginsberg. And uh, Christine, are we able to move Nick into the presenter mode? Is that possible? I'll introduce Nick while we have a look at that. So Nick um, is an innovator, a passionate executive assistant to senior executives. And Nick was recently listed as a finalist in the CEO Magazine Global Executive of the Year Awards for 2020. What an absolute phenomenal achievement. When not supporting the Provost and the Senior Vice President at Monash University, Nick is managing his Instagram account, creating content for his very own YouTube channel, running workshops and coaching sessions for others. Today, Nick will use his own wealth of experience in a busy dynamic role to demonstrate how having strong emotional intelligence can help to build great relationships. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Nick and don't forget to log your questions in the chat for after both of our speakers have presented. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Fiona. Wow, what an intro. That was, uh, that was very impressive. You made me sound fantastic. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me on. I'm very excited uh, to, to come and speak. So as Fiona said, I'm the EF of the Provost, which I'd love to say is a nine to five role. Um, it's not. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a little more than that. And then outside of that, I do a lot of my own stuff. So I run my own business. I provide coaching and workshops and whatnot. Now, the thing that I found, particularly since COVID has hit, is people have gotten a bit shaky around effective communication. So how to communicate effectively within the work environment when you're no longer situated with one another. And I found that myself to a degree. So I run workshops on effective communication and I still hit a speed bump. Right. So when my boss and I started working from home, I put all the things into play that I knew that would work and then went, "Ugh, this doesn't feel the same. And everyone I've spoken to feels a bit of a disconnect when they're working from home. Now, I think what happens when we're during this sort of COVID time, we have to focus so heavily on the emotional intelligence side of things to make sure that we are listening 
actively, we're listening, we're, we're hearing what isn't being said, we're, we're able to understand the intent of what someone is saying. So, so much of our communication now is Zoom, email, text, phone calls. We no longer have the face-to-face, -face, right? So you miss the, the non-verbal cues. So you miss the body language because all you're seeing is this. I'm not Madonna. That was just a bit of a frame to kind of, yeah. Um, thank you for laughing, Fiona. Um, so you miss that, right? So you have to do other things to try and understand that intent. So for me, what I found has really worked is focusing so heavily on putting yourself in the other person's shoe. Now, this works across everything. So uh, sort of verbal, face-to-face uh, -face when you finally get to be able to do it, but written especially, Zoom, it, there is, if you put yourself in someone else's shoes, try and understand where they're coming from, regardless of the topic. It really does shift how you're able to communicate. So for example, for me, universities, as we all know, are having a little bit of a rough time at the minute. I don't think anybody's skipping down the lane, sort of having a, a grand old time. But what that, what that means is that everyone in the university is stressed to a degree. COVID is stressful enough. And then you add other, other factors onto that and people are stressed, right? My boss, who is an amazing man, I could not say a bad word about him, not publicly, not privately, neither. He's a lovely, lovely, lovely man. He sent me a text at the beginning of COVID and pre-COVID, I wouldn't have read anything into that. I would have gone, yep, of course, I'm on it. I got this text and because I was feeling a little sensitive myself, just with everything that was happening, I instantly went, oh my God, he hates me. Why does he hate me? What have I done? Now, that wasn't an emotionally intelligent response. I didn't put myself in his shoes. I didn't try and understand the intent in which he was saying it. He was stressed out. It was just a quick message. That is why I focus so heavily, so in all the workshops I've done over COVID, particularly around this, is around emotional intelligence. So understanding the intent. The other thing that I will uh, uh, touch on quickly is we need to look out for potential misunderstandings across everything that we're doing when people are highly stressed. When people are highly stressed, all of their uh, emotional intelligence disappears, all of their, their ability to be able to communicate effectively goes a bit wobbly. So when you are stressed, which is going to happen post-COVID, currently now, it'll happen, you need to be able to stop, recenter yourself, and think, how would what I'm saying, doing, typing, writing, whatever, how would that be received? You've got to ask yourself that question. Because if you don't, and you do a quick send off, someone may read it with the completely wrong intention. And then all of a sudden, you've got an issue. So... I'll leave you with that. I'd love to get any questions. I do not bite. I'm, I'm very friendly and happy to answer questions. But yeah, so really it is about putting yourself in other people's shoes, particularly during this time. You all should know how to communicate effectively to a degree. Everyone deserves a, a reminder every now and again. Absolutely, I do. But if you go back to that core of really trying to understand someone's intent, it can change the meaning of the message for you from something bad to something good. And you keep that communication open and positive. So 
that's my two cents. Thanks so much for sharing, Nick. I think that's um, a, a, a fantastic reflection and something that we can always be reminded of. There's so many assumptions we're making when we've now got a, a new environment where there, there mm. aren't those visual cues. So um, thank you. We look forward to seeing some questions come through the chat to be able to um, field those to you after Liz's spoken. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. It now gives me the greatest of pleasures to introduce uh, Lynn Bailey. I first met Lynn, um, oh, she was my boss actually, in the late 1990s. I don't know if we could put a year on it, Lynn, but it was a while ago. <laughs> and since then, I have greatly admired Lynn and the, the many twists and turns her career has taken and the unique way in which Lynn has innovated within a variety of education industries. Lynn has worked in both the higher ed and TAFE sector in senior roles, driving strategy and change alongside managing complex operations. Lynn is currently the Director of Quality Learning and Teaching and Students. Wow, is there nothing you can't do, Lynn? <laughs> uh, at the University of, oh, let me have a go, Puthasatra, maybe close, uh, in Cambodia. So today, Lynn will share with us how she has learned to empower people and other life lessons, please join me in welcoming Lynn Bailey to our Knowledge Nibbles. Thanks so much, Fiona. Can I check, first of all, that you can hear me after the uh, dramas earlier? I love a good bit of technology myself, and hasn't it all just made our lives so fabulous, and particularly in these COVID times? So thank you very much. And um, can I say how happy I am to be in the company of university administrators, truly the most resilient and professional of colleagues that it's possible to have. And uh, boy, is that resilience and professionalism required right now, maybe more than ever. Um, it was cruel of you to mention 1999 in Swinburne, but I'm going to go back and say that I started in tertiary education in 1972 when I joined what was then Melbourne State College, now part of the University of Melbourne, I feel absolutely required to um, emphasise that I was three when I started at Melbourne State College. Uh, back then, as a finance administrator who knew nothing about finance administration, my job was mostly to say no a lot, except to my boss, whose management style and communication style was just to bark commands. One of his early commands um, was to tell me that I needed to talk to a dean in April to tell him that he had exhausted his annual budget, which was of course meant to last till December. Do it in person, I was told. So I phoned the dean to say that I needed to see him about his budget. And he said, because he was a nice guy, I'll come to your office. He hadn't met me before. I hadn't been there very long. And he said he wanted to see me in context, as he put it at the time. He arrived in my office, which was about the size of a small bathroom, opened up my coat cupboard, stepped in and closed the door behind him. I was left standing at the cupboard door, begging him to come out. Brian, it'll be all right. I, you know, um, I just need to talk to you. Mr. Ma told me I needed to talk to you. I was so traumatised by this that to this day, I don't remember how and under what circumstances he came out of the coat cupboard. What I do remember, though, and what has stood me in great stead over the years was talking to my boss the next morning about this traumatic event. So as I was telling him, the director of, of Melbourne State College happened to be walking past to his office and overheard me, much embarrassment on my part, to be telling this tale of woe. Graham Allen, a wonderful guy, laughed a lot and said, what you have to remember, Lynn, is that these people are only academics. That means they are very skilled in a very, very narrow field. Most of them couldn't be trusted to cross a road unattended. You just need to think about how you talk with them so that they understand. That was a big lesson for me. I felt much comforted about it. I'm not sure how Brian, my dean, thought about it but I found that very comforting. And it is something that I have thought about a lot. 
I love my academic colleagues. I'm very aware of their frailties. When I moved into academic administration, so away from finance, my job moved from saying no all the time to saying, do this and do it this way, a lot to other staff. But there was still a lot of saying no, especially to students. Over the years, as my career developed and grew and the culture changed, the words changed a bit. I moved into student admin and student support. Administration frequently became service delivery and the word retention came to life. We hadn't had to worry about retention before students came and went and that was just life. What I realized over time though, was that I had become a micromanager not a good form of communication to be a micromanager. I worked stupid hours because I loved my work. I needed to see everything that was being done by my staff and I needed to see it done preferably the way I would have done it myself. I took all the roles I had very seriously, had some great leaders and one or two that were not so good. I thought they were an aberration, the not so good ones, and I still continue to hope they're the aberration. But I still learn from them. When I reflect on each of them, and I am a serially reflective practitioner, what I learned was that their ability to lead and achieve was largely an outcome of how well they communicated with us individually and collectively, and how, whether they realised it or not, they modelled what they stood for, good or bad, through their communication style. A seminal experience for me came when a leader I really respected and who many of you would know, Stephen Weller, he was the president of ATEM, one of the, well, probably the greatest leader I've had. Um, Stephen repeated through many discussions that our number one job as leaders was to be courageous in our communication with everyone supervisors, peers, and team members. Honest, but respectful. He accepted nothing less. After that, he said the next most important thing to do was to train up the team. One of my colleagues said, but what if I train them up and they leave? To which he replied, what if you don't and they stay? He believed absolutely that all of us were members of a scholarly learning community and that we should act that way. We talked about ourselves then as a team, no longer just staff, certainly not support staff as we had been when I started at Melbourne all those years before. We saw ourselves as integrity to the university's culture and outcomes and I strenuously support that throughout my my career following, it's, it's been a cornerstone for me. We are part of the scholarly learning community. We are here to learn. Over the course of my career in various universities, um, where I've had the privilege to work, and it has been a privilege, and my endless reflection on what happened in each of those institutions, I came to an understanding about how I was going to try to be in my roles. I have not always been successful and certainly not all the time. In every job I've had successes, some amazingly satisfying, some surprising, some hard won, all celebrated by me because we need to make time to celebrate the good. In every job I've had failures. I am very much a glass half empty girl for me and a glass at least half full and usually overflowing for my team. Failures, of course, came more frequently in earlier leadership roles because I tried to manage or at least oversee everything. It's not possible and it's disrespectful. If you need to micromanage, then either you have the wrong team or the wrong people within that team or you are the wrong leader for that team. I'm not talking about liking them. Liking your team individually and collectively is a bonus, in my opinion. It's something that usually happens, but it's not a requirement. What you need to be able to do is to work with them. And that's about communication, two-way communication. And I certainly take the emotional intelligence uh, perspective on that too. That's really important. How you read something, it's all about audience and purpose, isn't it? You have to think about who it is you're talking to and what the purpose is. Otherwise, the risk of of um, you know, misunderstanding and reading something in a particular way that isn't intended is just so likely to happen. 
Many years ago, I was privileged to attend a seminar on positive workplace culture. My main takeaway was that a positive workplace culture is often and perhaps mostly about what and how we communicate with each other. I've learned that through, I've learned through success and failure and reflection on both, that my personal bottom line is this, with communication, it's all about integrity. Communication with integrity is probably the most important aspect of any role. What you communicate is important. How you do it is essential. A few sort of reflections on this for me. Respect everyone's time. We all believe we are busy and stressed. That's because in universities today, we are all busy and stressed. There's no happiness around universities at the moment in Australia. And um, I would have to say in my current location at Cambodia, it's, um, it's a similar story. But the fact that we're busy and stressed doesn't mean that we shouldn't spend the time and energy and thought in talking with our team with not to it just means we have to communicate more in my opinion and better for me you need to tell your team and your colleagues what's going on at work unless it would breach confidentiality withholding information that could help them to understand a context or a nuance or an impact is never a good idea at best it's forgetful at worst it's neglectful or a power play None of those things represent good communication, let alone leadership. My advice about communication, not something I always stick to, I have to say, but I do try. Stay positive. That's not easy, especially now. Expect from your team and model yourself a no whinge solution focused approach. We don't have time for people who just come along with a, a shopping list of this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, that person's offended me, this hasn't happened. You need people who are going to come with solutions, even if they're in the end not workable. At least you, you can then have the confidence that the person coming to you has thought about it. They're not just taking your time. Make a point of giving others in your team recognition and continually encourage them. One of the worst things you see, I think, is where someone else does a whole lot of work and their leader appropriates that to go further up the tree. I think that's just abysmal behaviour and a failure of communication. You are not representing your team members. And as a worker, a worker bee, as I have been, and we are all worker bees in the end in some way or other, it's hard not to feel resentful when your work is appropriate appropriated listen to others and wherever possible act on their suggestions because that is a way of getting engagement and showing respect and by doing that in my opinion you get people prepared to do far more with you and for you than they would otherwise where you have a problem communicate that directly to that person and try to find a resolution don't tell everyone else about it if i've got a problem with nick i'm not going to run it and tell fiona because what am i doing i'm trying to recruit fiona to my side oh look at nick isn't he terrible and fiona has a terrible situation there it's so unfair and it's so counterproductive and for heaven's sake don't tell Fiona or Nick in an email that you've got a problem with him. Go and talk to him. And, and even in these COVID days, do it face-to-face -face via Zoom if that's what's required. Not an email. Be respectful. Accept that we all make mistakes. Not everyone can be as perfect as we are. Isn't that sad? But that's the sad, sad truth and reality. Just make sure that when you make a mistake, you learn from it and that your team learns from it. Remember, we are part of that learning community. Encourage everyone to express an opinion. I once heard, I was very fortunate to hear a keynote address by Sir John Daniel, who at that time was VC at the Open University and went on to become, I think, Deputy Director at UNESCO and then Director of the Commonwealth of Learning. Fantastic fellow who said that his key learning about communication was to respect and explore the views of people who strongly disagreed with his own or with his proposals for change. He said that this often led him to change or at least modify his own ideas. When it didn't lead to change, he found that his team, having been heard, were mostly able to accept 
the decisions that were made, even if they didn't necessarily agree with them, and could then go out and advocate those. Again, it's about being res respectful. I try, don't always succeed, to communicate in every situation. I think I'm always a person of integrity. I certainly try. And then I try to add in kindness, dignity, trust, respect, acceptance, all those things that we would like. And don't forget to make time to laugh, especially at yourself, because humility goes a long, long way. Even those of us who are perfect have to learn to be humble sometimes. The big one for me, and this sort of reflects what Nick said, treat everyone the way they would like to be treated, not the way you would like to be treated. It's hard and sometimes it's very hard. We instinctively reach, I think, for a solution that we think, well, that would work for me, so I will respond in this way. But more often than not, it's treating everyone the way they would like to be treated that works. As I said, I can't remember how I got the head of film and TV at Melbourne State College out of my coat cupboard, but I'd like to think it's because that even though I was young and inexperienced, I had integrity and I managed through my communication, maybe even it was just begging, but that's you know, whatever works in the end, I convinced him uh, that both of us would be okay if he did. That's the end of my part of the chat and uh, looking forward to more conversation with you now. And thank you for the time and the invitation. Oh, thank you so much, Lynn. I feel like um, both yourself and Nick have given us more than a nibble. You've given <laughs> us a true gift and, and a sizable pleasure of, of knowledge to be able to take away today. And you can see from the hands around the screen how appreciative um, our fellow guests are of, of your time and your wisdom. So now over to you. Has anyone got... Um, I've seen some great chat there while our speakers have been presenting. Any questions for Nick? And Lynn, that anyone would like to ask, um, feel free to sing out. Um, in the meantime, I can certainly, um, I'll ask Nick a kickoff question while we wait. Um, Nick, you talked about um, the variety of ways in which people are communicating right now. And it's, uh, it is a challenge. It's the phone, it's the text, it's the Zoom, it's the email, it's, it's the report. So what do you use to really make sure that you are truly listening and engaging when you've got those multiple sources coming at you? Oh, good question. Um, so I, I will often, if I'm, so if I'm talking to someone on the phone or via Zoom, I will focus on a point of the screen to block everything else out around me. It's usually, and this is not in a creepy way, it's usually looking at the speaker dead in the eyes. That's my way of kind of focusing. I do not do that in real life. That is a smidgen creepy if you maintain full eye contact the whole time. Um, but that's what I do. I focus on a point of the screen and that's what I do. Now, what I've found, because what we have at work is that there's, so many corridor conversations that we're just not having anymore. And so all of those have moved to other forms. And if you don't initiate those yourself, sometimes they're just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly picking up the phone, talking with our chief of staff in our office, talking with other people within my team, other EAs, trying to figure out what is going on. And the whole time I'm doing that, I'm focusing on what is happening at that point in time. The TV's off, the music's off. It is just me focusing on that point to block out as much as I can. Um, but yeah, great question. Yeah, it's certainly hard, isn't it? I'm, I'm almost to the, to the day, I will have worked from home longer than I've actually worked in the office since starting the role and I, I'm, I'm missing the personal connections that I would have made if I'd bumped into people on campus by mm -hmm. now in terms of having the people to talk to. But I love that, that visual point, that cue. That's really helpful. So, Lynn, um, your, um, your, your um, presentation was, was very thought-provoking and challenging. So I guess I'm, I'm curious as to sh for you to share with us, what was the catalyst for, for you knowing that you needed to stop micromanaging and how did you challenge yourself to really stand by that, that, that decision you'd made? Thank you for the opportunity to humiliate myself publicly and to explain just how dreadful a parent I was. 
Um, a hundred years ago, I was working at Australian Catholic University when it had just become a university. And I had been given the job of bringing together handbooks from four states and I think eight separate colleges, old Catholic teachers' colleges. And so as someone who loved my work, adored the person I worked for, felt so incredibly privileged and fortunate, I literally worked around the clock for weeks and weeks and weeks because it was really urgent, really important. It was part of the change of culture of the organisation, blah, 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 from state-based and individual college-based. And um, I was having a fabulous time right up until one of my children telephoned the executive assistant and asked to make an appointment to see her mother. Oh. And um, I thought, okay, there you are, worst person in the world. If you're lousy at being a parent, you know, and you're probably lousy at doing this job too, because it was the first time I'd, you know, as I say, it was a long time ago in the 90s. Um, and we weren't particularly skilled, you know, I'd, I'd learned how to use Word myself, but bringing together all those handbooks with conflicting ideas about what an admission policy and an assessment policy should be and trying to negotiate with deans from all the place. Yeah. Uh, so I was feeling a bit rattled at the time. And then I got this, um, could we make an appointment to see mum? And I thought, okay, I need to just accept that maybe this first time through it's going to be 98% perfect, not 110% perfect, and I probably need to do something else. And then I really had the experience, Fee, of reintroducing myself to friends and family, because, and I realised I'd spent just every waking hour at work, and when I wasn't actually at work, I'd brought it home, and I'd sort of pat the kids on the head, and, oh, look, there's dinner. Quickly, eat dinner, eat dinner, eat dinner, do your homework, leave me, I've got some work to do. So, yeah. Mm. There's no way to live your life. And I have repeated this a million times, and I'm sure you've heard it from elsewhere, but no one on their deathbed says they wish they'd spent more time at the office. Yeah. And um, I wonder if one of the lessons from COVID is that we are putting a whole lot of things into perspective. Work is important, but it doesn't define us. And if it does, wow, I think we need to have a bit of a look. Yeah. What a lovely gift. Thank you, Lynn. You've given me tingles and <laughs> teary, actually. Um, and I'm sure your girls are very grateful for the time you've given them. It actually so, turned out quite nicely, all things considered. <laughs> well, well done. Now, we have um, a couple of questions for our speakers today. Um, firstly, from Kate, would be interested to hear from either of you on implementing boundaries during this time, either in terms of boundaries with colleagues and in terms of energy and time management um, when working from home online. Um, so who'd like to have a go at that question? Yeah, far oh, away, oh, Nick. Thank you. So I am a big fan of boundaries, uh, very big fan of boundaries. And being an EA, uh, there are a lot of EAs that don't have boundaries. <laughs> um, and it's really important that we have boundaries set up. So when we started working from home, I didn't have proper boundaries set up and I ended up working from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., 8 p.m. I was sitting on the same chair the whole time, not moving from my desk uh, and it's stupid. It was really dumb <laughs> of me to do that because I was running myself into the ground. And then I realised that I couldn't do it anymore. So I went back to what I do in the office, which is time blocking and scheduling myself, uh, my day myself. So lining it up with my, my boss. So for me, I do that. For you, it'd be scheduling your day so that you have time to breathe. At 12 o'clock, so I'm a creature of habit, by the way. So I start work at 7.30 in the morning. Come 12 o'clock, if I haven't eaten lunch, I'm probably going to eat the desk. So from 12 to, to 1.00, I am away from this desk. I will put on a Netflix show and I will eat lunch and watch that so that I know I've at least got 45 minutes away from my desk. At five o'clock at the end of the day, I will log off my computer, I will grab the dog and we will go for a walk. That stops and breaks that work and home sort of uh, boundary. You've got to make sure that the two are separate because you've got to look after, and this sounds very hippie, but you've got to look after your energy. 
Yeah. Because you will unravel very quickly. So, but so doing that time blocking, grab grab the dog, grab God, put put a leash on the cat and go take it for a walk. I mean, just get out of the house and make sure that you are separating work from home. Thanks, Nick. My husband has this amazing way of doing it. Um, he says goodbye to me every morning and says, I'm off to work now and, and kisses me goodbye. And he goes into one study and I go into the other. And whoever gets home first says, hello, the house, I'm home. <laughs> and it's become a great marker to be able to find that separation. Lynn, have you got any um, tips and tricks for our, our, our guests and members? Look, it's really hard, isn't it? And I, and I find it very difficult um, because of the current circumstances, you know, I'm, I'm normally located in Cambodia, but I came home for what I thought was a couple of weeks early in March and I'm still here. So we have a three hour time difference. Currently it was four that it, uh, it will be four again in a few weeks that adds a, you know, degree of difficulty that's probably worth a few points. Um, and I must say that when I came back, it was two weeks of isolation, not quarantine. And it was, very easy to be not in my house. I'm in my daughter's house. I've rented out my house for while I'm away in Cambodia. Um, so not in my house. So you, the obvious and easy thing to do is to work very long hours. And so I did, you know, I was back almost to the crazy days of I'll just, you know, get up in the morning and might as well start with the computer open while I have breakfast and, you know, then you, everyone else doesn't arrive until 11 or 12. Um, and then they're working till eight o'clock at night. So you work till eight o'clock at night. And then, well, there's those few things I didn't finish off. And that's just, you know, stupid. It's really stupid. And, and fortunately, um, my daughter and son-in-law kind of uh, like to have dinner together and like to have a chat at the end of the day and like to have a chat in the middle of the day because they too are in very stressful jobs and working from home. So we, we do make sure that we eat together. And I'm a bit like Nick in that I put boundaries around, you know, this is the time when I have a look at emails. This is the time when I'm going to sit and write all those fabulous policies that we all love so much and that the University of Putasastra for your information fee um, doesn't have as yet. Uh, but it's, I think it's even more difficult now to, for people, for everyone to be strong and firm with themselves and say, that's it. I now need time for me. There's a magazine that's calling me. There's a walk that needs to be done, you know, whatever it is. But uh, it, we think we're getting through more work if we just work long, 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 long hours. It's not true. It's just not true. Mm. Thank you, Lynn. Um, that's lovely. I have another follow-up question for you from Mark. Um, reflecting on always working to communicate with integrity and he asks, I'm finding we're being increasingly challenged by stakeholders when communicating complex, difficult or unpopular information in a shoot the messenger type of scenario. Do you have any tips for maintaining reputation and integrity while telling people what they don't want to hear? Um, I think it's really easy to maintain integrity uh, if you really, if you put that at the forefront um, but it's not easy to do the communication. That's, that's, that's true. But I, I think the days, I hope the days are gone where you feel like you have to trot out the party line, you know, where we're going to cut 4 million staff from the university that will leave 10 people to do the work of all those 4 million people. And that's just how it is. Um, that's certainly how it was when I first started work a very long time ago. And I'm not sure that that kind of attitude has gone completely, but it's not an attitude that I'm prepared to buy into because that costs me too much emotionally and costs me a sense of integrity. I think it's all about empathy and saying to people, yes, this is awful. Because what's, you know, my personal opinion and my political opinion is that what's happening in universities at the moment is appalling and disgraceful and we will be very regretful that it's happened and 
um, if I were in a position of having to tell people that I'm really sorry, we're going to have to downsize, I would, I would, without being perhaps political, um, it's hard for me not to be sometimes, uh, I would say, look, I can't tell you how distressing it is for me, but I am not going to say that my distress is anything like your own. Uh, you know, that this is a terrible situation and, and I regret this so much. Um, because if you do it without saying that, then I think that lacks integrity, that lacks empathy, that lacks humanity, and it's not okay. But I don't think any of those circumstances are ever easy. And I don't ever want them to be easy. And I really worry about the boss who says, oh, you've just got to do it. And that's that. If you don't do it, you know, feeling like you've got a knife through your heart, then I have real concerns about your leadership. Mm. Thanks, Lynn. Yes, it's a challenging time for all institutions uh, right now. And for those of you located in Victoria, of course, our our current um, stay-at-home regulations certainly put an extra pressure on us. Um, I am conscious of the time and um, our promise to you that we wouldn't keep you too long. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about my platters. They're getting a little crusty around the <laughs> might have hit the mark where we're getting into a little bit of poor hygiene territory. So firstly, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Bank First, for making today possible. Each of you for giving up your precious time to share a knowledge nibble with us. Our Connecting People and Groups team, Nicola Howard, Andrea Nazari, Roberta Anderson and Julie McCusker for um, putting together um, today. Our, our superstar REO, Christine plume Joe, for being the uh, superstar and tying all of the beautiful pieces together. And finally, our sensational guest speakers, Lynn Bailey and Nick Ginsburg. Nick and Lynn, we have a small gift of appreciation coming to you by snail mail, so in the goodness <laughs> of time, <laughs> uh, depending on the, uh, the uh, strength of Australia Post. But um, we certainly want to um, thank you both. You've, you've just been an incredible um, gift for us today. And I'm just going to do my best. Now, can you all see that, what's coming up next? I'm going to hope you are. Can you all see that? It's um, our programs that we've got coming up next, including University Governance with the Good, the Bad, the Ugly with the great Dr. Damien Barry, who's on um, our Zoom session today. So if you'd like to register for that, please do so. And the famous Emma Maslin is running another committee management and minute taking um, session. We can't run these fast enough for the amount of demand they are. They are just so well renowned. And of course, there's a range of other ATEM programs available on the website. And uh, we will have another Knowledge Nibble session um, on the 20th of October about career journeys and opportunities. So we really look forward to um, having you there for um, that session again. And I'm very grateful, of course, for our sponsor and Doretta for making today possible. We'll be popping some information on email to you just with some um, follow up. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next time. So thank you all for sharing. It's been great to see you today, particularly some familiar faces. I feel quite heartened that it's not quite the same as a member breakfast, but we get to see you all, which is just a pure treasure. So thank you all very much for today.